All right, today I want to talk about answering critics. If you are a Christian, you don't even have to be in ministry, you're going to run into critics. That's just part of being saved. Uh, the Bible says that the, mass, the, the, the majority of people are on their way to hell. And so those people, most of them do not, do not want anything with sal- to do with salvation. Um, some do, some, a lot of them don't. But you're going to run into people who are going to be very critical of what you believe as a Christian. And uh, the last hymn that we sang here this morning before the message was My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And I just want to read the first uh, line here again of it. It says, My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Of course, a lot of you are familiar with that hymn. But the point is, we have to remember... We have to keep in mind that really all you need is this book. All you really need is salvation. Jesus died, that's enough. Okay? Well, yes, but what about uh, this ancient text over here? Whatever, I don't care. Jesus died for me, I know he died for me. That's it. You know, we as Christians, it's good to study the answer, but you can take that too far. And a lot of Christians, I know we talked about this before, like the issue of Calvinism and some of these other issues, you just you end up making the Bible teach it, it, it way more difficult than it has to be. These systems, these man-made systems, what it, what's it about? Well, it's about somebody who wants to rule over other people. So they come up with some kind of a system that overcomplicates the Bible. The message of the Bible is actually very simple. Okay, it's a story of how God is dealing with man. And how that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for their sins. And all you have to do to go to heaven is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And your body is prone to sin. And therefore, you have to die. You're you're going to die. The wages of sin is death. You know, you'll end up in hell. And the way out of it is Jesus Christ. Simple. But, unfortunately, it's not that simple with the lost world. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. First mm-hmm. Peter chapter three verse ten is where we're going to start out today. Okay, it says here, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Now, right there, most people don't qualify. They'll say, "Oh, life is good." Do they refrain their tongue from evil? No. They'll use profanity. Well, then life's not good. Okay, it might be good for you if you're a lost sinner and, and really have no need for God. You, you might deceive yourself into thinking it's good, but it's not. Verse 11, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? That's the way it's supposed to be when you're living in a just society. If you're doing good... Really, nobody should harm you. Unfortunately, a lot of times that doesn't quite work out. <laughs> a lot of times, especially now here in this world, uh, if you're good, if you're innocent, a lot of times there are people that will go after you. But um, this passage mostly is talking to Christians, by the way, too. I don't, I don't mean to say that you know the first verse there is referring to the lost. You know, It's very true for the lost, but for a Christian, you're definitely supposed to refrain your tongue from evil. But anyhow, continue on here. Verse 14. But if, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now you see there the thing that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. You refrain your tongue from evil, there's no guile in your mouth, 
You sanctify the Lord God in your heart and you're ready to give an answer to every man. And verse 16 says you have a good conscience. But look what happens. Look what the lost world does. Whereas they speak evil of you. Huh? Did you know that if you speak truth today as a Christian, you'll be said, it'll be said of you that you're narrow minded, that you're bigoted, that you're a hate criminal? And they're even saying terrorists now, too, for a Bible believing Christian. Yeah, that's the way it's going to be. It's right there. Don't think that you're going to get to a point where you're going to fit into the lost world, where you're going to be respected by the lost. It's not going to happen. I mean, you're doing all kinds of nice things here. Speaking good, good conscious, no, no guile coming out of your mouth, and people still are not going to like you. That's just the way it is. And why? Because Christ also hath once suffered. Okay? That's the way it is. You follow Jesus Christ, you're going to get the same reproach that He got. Uh, we're going to go next to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the point I want to make here talked about that you should be, you know, ready to always give an answer to every man. Um, how can you give an answer to every man if you don't study? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Christian life is about studying, sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. Okay, you have to study as a Christian, and that takes work. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter two verse twenty two says here, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now look at verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We'll get back to that in a minute. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Okay? It's a very interesting thing there. It says there in verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. I've talked about this before, but did you know that there's no such thing as a good sin? You know? I mean, is fornication good? No. To the lost, they might think it's a, well, that's a really good thing. No, it isn't. It's a bad thing. There are a lot of young people that get messed up for the rest of their lives because of one night of lust. You know? What about uh, drinking, drunkenness? A lot of people can get messed up for the rest of their life because of that. I know of a, a number of different people that I've heard of or known, and they have one night as a teenager where they get drunk, and they're with their buddies that are drunk, and they're in a car accident, and they're scarred for the rest of their life. You know? Well, just one time. You know, a little bit doesn't hurt. Yeah, it does. There's no such thing as a sin that God keeps from people, and you say, oh, he's so mean because he's keeping that from me. All sin is negative. You are opposing yourself when you're sinning. Okay? But notice it says there, in meekness, instructing those. Okay, and we're going to be looking at that today in this in this study. There are times when you need to be meek. And I believe when you deal with anybody, it should start out with meekness. And there's a lot of brethren that do not have that grace for people. They're just instantly confrontational. You can't be that. As a Christian, you have to start out with meekness. Now, it escalates past that, depending on the way the person comes to you. If they're coming to you as a skeptic and and just looking to mock you and whatever else, you don't have to meek, be meek the whole time. Okay, there's we're going to see that as we continue in this study. But it should start out with meekness. But notice verse 23, that's another very important verse here. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. There are some questions that people are just asking you just to make you mad. And you say, well, i got to answer everybody. No, you don't. Right there it says you're to avoid. And you, we're going to see that in this study as we continue. There are some things that you just, hey, whatever, you know. And, and people will oftentimes, like you debate an evolutionist or an atheist, they'll attack Christianity, they'll lump you in with Muslims, they'll say you're, 
the Catholics killed people, and they'll, you know, that's organized religion, and they'll get you off into debating in that area. Why? Because they're trying to avoid salvation, the issue of salvation. If you ever debate with an atheist, if you ever get into an argument with them, keep it on salvation. Because that's the reason they're an atheist. Okay? There's nobody that, I, I don't believe in that there's anybody out there who really honestly can look at all this out here, this nature, and say, I don't believe that there is a God. You know? They're without excuse, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1. They're without excuse. So what is the purpose of, of atheism? It's to get away from salvation. And they'll try to get you off of the simplicity of the gospel of salvation. Don't let them do it. But we'll continue on here. Uh, now, what, what kinds of people are you going to encounter on the spiritual battlefield of today? Look over there at chapter 3. And a lot of these verses we've been over numerous times here, but the point is, you know, you're to constantly go over these scriptures, renew your mind, keep these things uh, in your mind. Okay, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. Remember what we read over there in 1 Peter chapter 3? Uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's an interesting verse right there. Um, Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. What did Jesus Christ say about the heart of man? It's deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. He talked about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, now that's that's something that a lot of people don't understand. They just think it's all up here, intellectual issues in their head. No. Your heart is what you feel. You might not necessarily be able to reason it out and rationalize it and stuff, put it down on paper, but it's something that's about you. Uh, or what you're made up, what your makeup is, okay? And there are people that, I mean, that's what an atheist is. They're saying the fool hath said in his heart, doesn't say in his mind. The atheist can look at the complexity of nature. He can look at the complexity of how he's been created, and he says, in his mind, he says, there's no way this happened by chance. But see, in his heart, his heart is desperately wicked. He wants to sin, and so he says, in my heart. I don't believe that there is a God. Okay? And so what does their study, what does their education consist of? Anything that they can find to justify their heart conviction. That's what they're doing. And that's why these guys, they'll go off, they'll get education, degrees, and, and whatever. They spend their whole life trying to find proof that God doesn't exist. They'll spend their whole life attacking this book right here. Because this book attacks them, and they know it. Now, when you're dealing with somebody like that, you're going to be dealing with somebody who's spent time educating themselves, and you might you might answer. They might throw 15 questions at you, 15 objections to the Bible at you, and you can answer 14 of them perfectly, put them in their place. But if you can't answer the one, they'll say, "See, that's why I can't be a Christian." They stand back like it's a, a big victory for them because you couldn't answer everything that they said. That's why I said, you get into a debate with somebody like that, get them back to the Bible. Are you a sinner? Yeah, well, I think the Catholic Church has killed... I don't care. Are you a sinner? I got into a big thing with an atheist at one time and I just kept going back. Are you a sinner? And he'd throw, he kept throwing stuff and this verse contradicts that. I said, are you a sinner? And he finally got to the point, he said, no, I'm not a sinner. And I said, right there, you're self-righteous. That's the reason that you're an atheist. And that was it. Argument over. <laughs> now look at verse 8. 
It says here, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They resist it. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. You know who one of the most famous atheists was that ever lived? The French philosopher Voltaire. He wrote some real vile stuff about the Bible, about the Lord Jesus. But guess what happened when he died? There's a testimony of when he died that he was laying in his hospital bed screaming and screaming about being feeling his feet going into the fire and he was burning and, and screaming and crying out to God, Oh God, help me, God help me, God help me. Too late. He went to hell and he burned. Why? Their folly shall be made manifest unto all men. The lost, wicked world, at some point in time, they might get away with it. God's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there's going to come a point in time when God says that's enough. And guess what? He isn't just going to say, I'm going to let you die in a nice, peaceful hospital bed after blaspheming me for years and years and years. He's going to say, I'm going to make an example out of you. Amen. And He will. Yeah. Why? So He receives the glory. He shows, you're not going to get away with that. You know, Adolf Hitler. Oh, the big bad Adolf Hitler. What happened to him? Died putting a gun to his head. Bang. What a failure. You know? Oh, he was the head of the Third Reich, you know, and the, the Fuhrer and all this stuff. The dictator of Germany had anything he wanted, could do anything. He wanted all this power and everything. Ended up in a bunker shooting himself in the head. Yeah. Coward's way out. Exactly. Yep. And see, as Christians, we can kind of start, our faith kind of diminishes a little bit because we look at the enemy and we go, oh man, there's so many of them out there. And what if they say something and I can't answer them? What am I going to do? You get away from that simplicity of salvation, that simplicity of the gospel. And you start thinking, i got to answer these people in every single little area. No, you don't. This is all you need right here. Take them back to salvation. You you deal with a lost person. Take them to salvation. Yo, what about this? We'll answer that some other time. What about salvation? You know? Because that's the real issue. But, continuing here. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 5. is another interesting passage. Of course, the whole Bible is really an interesting passage. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. A uh, couple things I want to notice here. First of all, it says there, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. Again, you can get into a debate with somebody and just waste all your time. You can spend hours talking to them, debating things in Scripture and whether or not the Quran is right or this or that. or what. Get it back to salvation. Bring it back to the Gospel if you're dealing with somebody that's lost. Okay? Why? Redeeming the time. You don't have a whole lot of time here on this earth. You know, I know even from a Christian perspective, when we get together, there's so much to talk about and so many things that you just want to fellowship, you know, and, and everything. And it's like, oh, time's gone, you know. Got to get back to the world, you know. It's going to be neat when we get to heaven because there's, you know, we're going to have time to fellowship <laughs> finally, you know. But then the work's going to be done too. I'm going to talk more about that later. But it says here in verse 6, let your speech be always with grace. Okay? You should have grace as a Christian. And you got to remember that. You have to keep in mind, and this is difficult. This really is a difficult thing. But you have to keep in mind the way you were before you were saved. And sometimes there are people that are, that are ignorant and they don't know any better. So again, you come to them first with meekness. You come to them with grace. Remember the way you were before you got saved. Or right as you got saved. Okay? There has to be that grace there. But look at the next line here. Seasoned with salt. Now notice something. Does it say, speak totally with salt? 
No. Does it say no salt in your speech? No. It says seasoned with salt. Salt is something that irritates. <laughs> you know, irritates the flesh. If you if you put salt on your flesh and just leave it there for a while, you know, you're going to get a pretty good burn there on your arm. It's something that's irritating to the flesh. That's what this book is. Okay? This book is irritating to the flesh. And so when you speak to somebody, you have to be meekness, have grace, but you have to have that honesty there too. Use Scripture. And it has to be a little bit of a jab. Not too much. Not too much salt. Just seasoned with salt. And it's kind of interesting. Here's another thing that you'll run into as a Christian. And that is a lot of times you'll be dealing with somebody and you will be tempted to not have faith that God will back you up in what you're saying. You know, somebody says, well, you know, I don't really know if Catholicism's that evil. You know, you can say, well, you know, we have our differences with them. We don't really believe the way, you know, that they do. But, uh, you know, no, you, you, you know, God will get, have your back. If you say, hey, you know what, Catholicism is evil. Well, my grandmother was a Catholic. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Well, she died. What are, you, what are you trying to say? Well, if she died as a Catholic and she believed what Catholicism teaches, then she's in hell right now. Oh, that's, that's too negative to say a thing like that. And, and, you know, I'm on my own here. God's certainly not supporting me. See, that's the kind of stuff that will go through your head. But what you have to realize is the Lord will bear witness to the truth. And He wants you to speak truth out of your mouth. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But He expects you to stand for the truth. And when you don't speak it, that's not a good thing. And it's weird because a couple times I've had to respond to people and I try to be as nice as I can, but I just go, boom, and I hit them with the truth. And I think, well, I'm going to lose this person. They're going to be mad at me. They're not going to ever write to me again. I'm going to get, you know them attacking me and you know the weird thing a lot of times they'll actually write back and say thank you for being honest why well because i put my faith in the lord and i just said well here we go you know the bible says this it's the truth i know this is going to offend you but here it is boom and the lord will actually he'll actually bear witness to it that's what i was thinking there but now look at verse 16 uh oh, i'm sorry no Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. I was thinking Colossians there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Galatians 4, 16. Here's another one. Just I wanted to hit this one quick just to throw this into the study because it's very true. Galatians 4, 16. Paul says here, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Sometimes you will. Okay? We're going to see a little bit later here the kinds of people that will accept the truth. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, this is what you're going to have to deal with when you're in any kind of ministry at all. It says here, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Notice the thing there, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Two-thirds negative, the first two are negative, reproving and rebuking. The third one, exhorting, is positive. Okay? Christianity, biblical Christianity, is very negative as far as what people want to hear in this world. Okay? But the exhortation has to be there too. There, is, there are some very positive aspects about biblical Christianity. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And again, it's perfectly fine to study to have a lot of information that you can give people a lot of different subjects but don't forget the simplicity of the gospel the simplicity of the scriptures 
Okay, the big thing right now among professing Christianity is to have to try and explain this book away. Try and go back to Greek or to Hebrew or whatever. Just having a simple faith and saying the King James Bible says it, I believe it. Oh, well, that's, you know, that's not quite enough. You know, we need more than that. No, you don't. No, you don't. Don't let people talk you out of a simple faith in the written Word of God. Now, next part of the message here. Should you answer a saved troublemaker? There are people out there that are, you know, they are saved. They've just had the wrong kind of training. They've all gone off to a Bible college or they've listened to a false teacher. And they are definitely saved. You talk to them about salvation. They know about salvation. They've definitely gotten saved. They have the right testimony. But they're off on their belief on the Bible or whatever. Okay? Should you answer them? Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And here you have a good one for the Bible correctors. 2 Timothy 2.14 says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. People start making contentions of words in this book. Don't bother with them. Just say, well, you know, I mean, you can throw a couple things at them, but don't spend a lot of time with somebody that just wants to attack the Word of God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, turn over there. I had some dealings with a guy this past week who claimed that he actually went to Ruckman's church and actually created Gail Ripplinger's website, her first website, and he's now a Bible corrector. Oh yeah, and he was doing this whole thing of the which, you know, which Bible's perfect, the 1611 or the 1769, he's doing that whole thing, and I was writing back to him and stuff. And I quoted these verses, and he goes, oh, that has nothing to do with this. I'm like, yes, it does. We're going to see it here. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. His big thing was 1 John 5, 12 and 16, 11 says the Son, you know, the and then the newer one here says the Son of God. Okay? Now, I don't believe for one second that it was intentional that they left out of God in 16, 11 and then years later they added it secretly. You know, give me a break. You know? It was obviously a printing error. Obviously. But see, this guy takes that little tiny thing, one little verse, and he uses that to reject the whole book. That's why I can't believe the King James Bible. you know. And then he said, but I, I, I just wanted to come to you in, in love as my brother and have this dialogue. I'm like, you're rejecting the Bible. I'm not going to dialogue with you. You know, what's a dialogue? You know, yeah. I'm like, you know, go away. I've answered you twice, and now we're done. I'm not going to write any more to you. Sorry. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse... 22 it says here hast thou faith have it to thyself before God happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin now in context here it's talking about eating meat or eating you know vegetables or whatever herbs talks about there uh, in verse 2 of chapter 14 but basically, it's talking about if you believe in something and you have faith that it's right, then that's what you're supposed to be doing. But if you know, hey, this is wrong, and you continue doing it anyhow, that's a problem. All right. And when it says there that he that doubteth is damned if he eat, it doesn't mean damned as in you lose your salvation. Okay, there are different 
uh, meanings of words in Scripture. You look at the context there, it just simply means that you will be, your life is never going to amount to anything. Okay? Um, that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get off topic here. But the fact is, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Um, Romans 10.17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, the question is, do you believe by faith that your Bible is God's word? I didn't say the King James Bible. Okay, I believe by faith that the King James Bible is God's word. But ask the new versions that, the new people that use the new versions that. Do you believe by faith that your book is God's word? And sometimes you'll have a new Christian. I, I was this way when I used the NIV. I believe by faith that I was holding the word of God. I didn't know any better. And that's why when somebody came along and I, I heard about the Bible version issue, I changed just like that. There wasn't any, well, no Bible's perfect. And, you know, I actually had somebody tell me that before I knew what was going on. And it was just like this shock to me that somebody who professed to be a Christian could say that no Bible's perfect, that they all have errors. See, I had faith in what I was reading. That, that doesn't mean that the NIV is okay, by the way, just because somebody believes it. Some people have that. Well, I believe it, so it must be okay. No, it doesn't work that way. But I will tell you this, God will have grace for somebody using a new version that believes it by faith. He'll have more grace for somebody like that than somebody who uses this King James Bible and doesn't believe it. And there are a lot of preachers that stand up every Sunday and read their sermon and quote the King James Bible, read from the King James Bible, and they don't believe it for one second. What's going on? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Something else. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 5. I'm going to show you something here that's kind of interesting. James 1 verse 5. This is true education here, by the way. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let that man, or let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, imagine for a minute a lot of these big Christian celebrities that are basically lying hypocrites. And I'm not saying that just to be mean or to be a jerk or something. That's what they are. They do not believe in the book that they preach out of. And yet they call it God's Word. I mean, it's such a basic thing. You know, if you're calling a book God's Word, it has to be perfect. Why is that so difficult for people to understand? But you get this guy up there, and he's up there preaching and stuff like that, and he does not believe this book. And he corrects it, but he calls it God's Word. You know what I think? I think at the judgment seat of Christ, they're not going to get anything. I think that they're going to get up there and their 30 or 40 years of preaching and television specials and stuff like that, I think the Lord's just going to go, yeah, you didn't do that of faith. You didn't believe the book that you were preaching. You were just doing it to, to make a lot of money. And those guys are making you know many millions of dollars. Okay? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You better believe by faith that you are holding the Word of God. And you say, well, I don't believe that about my Bible. Then you better get one that you can believe in. It's a bad thing. Okay, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Again, we've been over this verse before, but we're going to be hitting a lot of familiar Scriptures today. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. 17 and 18 actually. It says here, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know one thing I've learned from being in ministry? There's the hard way, and there's the easy way to do things. You know the, the hard way, 
is to put videos out there for absolutely free. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, oh, look at me. Just understand what I'm saying here. The hard way is to say, here's a video that I spent weeks on. My last big DVD was five months. Here it is. And I'm going to put it online for free, and anybody can copy the thing. See, that's the more difficult way. The easier way is to put it on and say, you know, put a little preview or something like that, and you can buy this, and it's copyrighted, and, you're, and if you dare, you know, make copies of it, I'm going to sick my lawyers on you and stuff like that. And see, I, I really shouldn't have said a lot of the things that I said in that video, too. I should have been a little bit more nice to the Catholic Church, and I shouldn't have put some of the facts in and things. I'd have sold a lot more videos, you know. And I definitely should not be in the house church movement because that alienates me from a lot of the Baptist temples, temples out there. You know, I, I'm probably not ever going to be a, a circuit riding Baptist evangelist simply because I stand against 501c3 church buildings. And YouTube is after me all the time. We want to monetize your videos. We want to put our ads on your videos. I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because they become part owner. See? It is much more difficult to do things the right way. Much more difficult. And as a Christian, I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to stand for this book, it's going to be a much more difficult walk. Much more difficult. You know, it's a lot easier when you get around other Christians to go in and say, every Bible's fine. There's not really any difference between the Bibles. That's easier. It's a lot easier to say, well, I don't want to be dogmatic. I mean... Maybe God used evolution. Maybe He didn't. I can't. I you know I don't want to offend. You know, I, that's a lot easier. Following Jesus Christ and sticking by the Word of God is more difficult. It's a whole lot more difficult. But why do they do it? it says here in verse eighteen: For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Okay, that's why these guys do it. You can live real good. You know, preachers, it used to be if you know you wanted to be rich, you wouldn't be a preacher. I mean, that was a, a bad thing to get into. You don't make much money. Nowadays, you can make a lot of money as a preacher in these big modern churches. Lots of money. But continuing on here, Matthew chapter 15. There's a lot of rabbit trails that I'm tempted to go down today. Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. Okay, it says here, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, uh, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch." You have to answer everybody, no matter what the situation, the circumstance, you have to answer everybody, right? Wrong. Wrong. There are some people, I mean, think about what's going on here. God manifests in the flesh and He says, let them alone. Who more than the Lord Jesus Christ could have answered these people? But He said, here's the truth, you want it? They said, nope. And He said, okay, goodbye. The Lord's not going to force Himself on anybody. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, this is justification for not witnessing to people. You should witness to people. You don't just say, well, you know, I believe that God has chosen His elect and they'll come to salvation regardless of what I do. Uh, no, I don't think so. You should witness to everybody. Okay? It's very difficult. But you should witness to people that you meet. But when they start to reject the truth and they mock and they don't want anything to do with it, let them alone. Don't keep going back and pounding them and pounding them and pounding them. Say something if you see them again, whatever. But if they don't want it, let them alone. Don't waste your time. Why? 
You're to redeem the time. You have a very short life. Okay, uh, one of the things I did before I got into ministry is, and this is in my personal testimony, I was a woodworker. And you know, sometimes I'd get a piece of wood and I'd put it on my lathe and I'd be turning it and it's just like perfect. You know, I mean, it, just real nice wood and the shavings are coming off real nice and everything, just beautiful to work with. And it turned into a beautiful vessel. Other times I'd get some piece of wood and the thing was contrary, it had... You know, I've had different times you'd be turning all of a sudden, you know, you'd hear this. There'd be a, a metal nail in it that you didn't see or something or just a terrible piece of wood. And I'd work with it and work with it. And finally, it's just like, you know what? I'm wasting my time. And I'd take that thing off the lathe and I'd take it out and I'd throw it as far as I could into the woods. <laughs> you know, why? Let them alone. There are some people that you're going to work with as a Christian that you're going to meet, that you're going to talk to, and they're just not going to want anything to do with the Bible. Let them alone. Move on to the next one. Okay? A little bit of advice there. Now we're going to see a real uh, truth seeker, what they look like. Jump down to verse 21 in Matthew 15 here. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, if you go back to Matthew 11, 20, we're not going to do that. I'm just going to read the verses here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 through 22 says, Then began he, he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. So what can you learn about Tyre and Sidon? There weren't many mighty works that were done there. For whatever reason, I guess they didn't want to accept the truth, so Jesus just kind of didn't do a whole lot there. Wasn't a whole lot going on there. But look what happens. Verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan... She was not a Jew. Came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hmm. Well, sorry there, lady. Uh... I'm only here for the you know, sheep of the house of Israel. Sorry, I can't answer you. And so she went home and forgot about it. Right? No. Verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She didn't just say, uh, excuse me, you really need to answer me on this. She came and she fell down and worshipped him and said, help me. Please help me, Lord. Uh, verse 26. But he answered and said... Sure, I'll help you, and I'll answer all your questions. Oh, that's not in there. He said, answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. What was her reaction? And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Wow. Jesus Christ tested her sincerity. Are you just coming to me just because, you know, you want this thing and I can do these, you've heard of me and whatever else, and you're just trying to use me or whatever? And he tests her. Okay, look at uh, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. There's that faith again. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Very interesting there. She passed the test that Jesus gave to her. Now, what can you learn from that story? What you can learn is if somebody really, honestly, truly wants to know the truth, they'll, they'll search for it, and they won't care how abrasive or militant or negative it is. Somebody that really is honest and sincere about wanting the truth, they'll come and they'll, and they'll, they'll really diligently look for it. They aren't going to come and ask you questions just to mock you. They're really, truly searching for it. Okay? And that's the kind of people that you need to be able to tell, you know, when they're actually honest about looking for the truth. 
And you'll find people like that. Now, that's for saved people asking questions. Okay. Now the question comes up, should you answer a lost troublemaker? Somebody who's, you know, answering a critic is the, is the message here this morning. So if you have somebody who's lost and they're a critic, go back to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 9. says here, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. What did we say earlier was a fool? Who does the Bible say is a fool? The fool has said, there is, uh, there is no, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Yeah, an atheist. Yeah. The Bible defines an atheist as a fool. And he says it in his heart, not in his head. You know, we've been over that before. So you're not to speak in the ears of a fool. Okay, when you get somebody that's at the point where they're denying that there is a God, you're dealing with a fool. Okay, you're dealing with somebody who's very deeply entrenched in their sin. Turn to uh, chapter 26 there in Proverbs. Proverbs 26, verse 4. It says here, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. I actually heard this used as a contradiction in the King James Bible. No, read the two verses and compare them. What it's saying there is sometimes you're not to answer them according to their folly because you'll be like them. They ask you a stupid question, and if you answer, try to answer it, it's going to just come out foolish. You say, well, give me an example. Okay. Do you believe animals have stopped evolving yet? That's a foolish question. See, because there's no way to answer it. No. If you say, yes, they've stopped evolving, then you're admitting that they did evolve in the past. If you say no, then that means animals are still evolving. You can't answer a question like that. Okay? But what do you do? How do you answer a question? Verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. You see, they have built this system of evolution and they say it's scientifically verified and whatever, you know, and they get all puffed up. Evolution is, you know, the answer. And us to answer them according to their folly. Say, oh yeah, the dogs evolved and, you know, they came from a, a banana plant and, you know, they fell down out of a tree and when they hit the ground, they evolved first to an elephant and then they turned into a dog again. You know, make a fool out of them. Okay, answer them according to their folly. When they come to you and they ask a stupid question, now if an atheist comes and he says, how do you prove the Bible is true? That's not a stupid question. Okay? You can give them scriptures. You can show them from the Bible verses that, that prove that this is God's Word. Okay? That's not a dumb question. But when you get these questions that they, they come up with to try and trap you, just play right along with it and be sarcastic. Do you believe one of your ancestors used to be a rock? Yeah. That kind of yeah. Yep. You, I mean, just ask them, you know, go along with their folly. Sometimes you have to do that. Now, you say, well, I don't know about sarcasm, though. I mean, th that doesn't seem like a Christian virtue. We're going to look at that. Was God ever sarcastic? Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. Minor prophets. Amos chapter 2, verse 4. Okay, it says here, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies cause them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. Okay, so you see there that they are rejecting God's word. Jump down to verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. And look at this, verse 7. They pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down a... Uh, upon 
clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Now, do you think that they were actually panting after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor? I doubt it. But what's God doing here? He's using sarcasm. He's saying these people are so covetous. They want money so badly that they're actually desiring to steal not only the money from the poor, but even the dust that's on their head. See, God is using sarcasm to attack these people. It is in the Bible. I'm sorry if you think that God's this lovey teddy bear that never is sarcastic and never mocks people. Right there, he's doing it. And we're going to see a couple more examples of that. Who was God manifest in the flesh? Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Don't often get a chance to preach much from Matthew 23, but this is one that a lot of modern Christians just try and avoid because they want to believe that the God of the Old Testament is gone and he's he was a, a bad guy and you know Jesus came and ended that whole thing. No, no, no. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Matthew chapter 23, verse 24. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, was Jesus speaking of something that was actually going on physically? No. You're not going to get somebody swallowing a whole camel. So what was Jesus Christ doing? He was being sarcastic. Okay, he was answering fools according to their folly. That's what he was doing. And what's he trying to, to show here? Well, basically, you have these people that come along and they say, the King James Bible says Easter, and it should be, you know, the Greek word is Pascha, and it should be Passover. And so that's why I reject the King James Bible. Wait a second. You reject the greatest book ever written because of one word? What are they doing? They're straining at a gnat. They can't get over this one word that I just, I don't think it was translated. And then they do, what do they do? They swallow the camel which is that the whole book is gone, the whole book is rejected, no Bible's inspired, they're all just translations, the Greek and Hebrew is just copies, and we don't really have... See, what you have to believe if you reject the King James Bible, you know, if you're not King James only, what you have to believe is just absurd. It's ridiculous. Like evolution. You have to reject creation out there, the complexity of nature that God created the heavens and the earth, you have to reject that. Well, then what's the other option? Well, you have to swallow the camel. The camel of evolution, that everything came from nothing accidentally. It's absurd. Okay? And, you, you know, well, I, I think we should have loving dialogue. No. No. You cannot have show respect for somebody that believes in evolution. Come to them in meekness. Come to them in grace, knowing that they are a sinner rejecting Jesus Christ. But don't show them any respect for their beliefs. You know? I mean, you have to tell them what you believe is a lie. Well, I, I, oh, I, I don't... Uh, that was kind of offensive. Good! You know? Don't show them any respect. It's ridiculous. I actually heard the one time this, this uh, sissy modern Christian, and he was talking about this one guy was like, he said these Mormons came to his door and he's like, you know what? We're, he said they started their little spiel and he's like, you know what? You people believe a false gospel. I don't have time to, to deal with you people right now. I'm, I'm just getting ready to leave. You are antichrist. And I mean, he just like blasted them. Get out of my, get off my property. And this, this little sissy modern Christian, he's like, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. He said, I invite him into my house and I say, now let's sit down and talk. I want to hear what you believe, and then I'll tell you what I believe. And we'll just kind of, you know, see if we can come to a reasonable conclusion. That's not the way you're supposed to handle things as a Christian. And it's interesting because if, you're, if you blast an unbeliever that is mocking the Bible, a lot of these modern Christians will say, you're not being Christ-like. <laughs> it's like, uh, you don't know Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. Yeah. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. Jump down there. We're going to see another uh, sarcastic thing that the Lord said to him. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. He compares them to tombs filled with dead men. Pretty incredible. And you say, and I know what people are going to say, they're going to say, yes, but that was God. You know, and Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. So it was okay for him to be sarcastic, but we shouldn't be. I've heard that one. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Okay, Romans 3. Verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Just stop right there for a second. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Paul was being Christ-like. Using the same analogy, the same sarcasm to attack the lost that Jesus Christ used. And it says the poison of asps is under their lips. What's he comparing them to? A snake? Yep. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Yep, they don't fear God. So, there you have a Christian being sarcastic in his dealing with the lost. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Just a couple more places to turn to. And we're going to be done for the day. Titus chapter 2. I'm sorry, Titus, chap, Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Titus chapter 2, verse... Er, Keep saying Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 1 verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Too many times as Christians, we think about the feelings of the person, the false prophet, and I don't want to rebuke them sharply because I don't want them to be offended. And What you need to think about is, are the people that are being deceived by that false prophet. And you've got to knock that guy down hard and say, that guy is a wicked false prophet, he's a lying devil, nail him hard, and use some sarcasm. That's the way it has to be. Why? Because you have to protect the other Christians out there. You know, Paul wrote about in Acts about how that he ceased not night and day to warn them with tears about false prophets. You should do the same thing. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. Here we're going to see a guy in how they deal with him. It says here, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. So you have a false prophet here. Verse 7, Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. See, he was a false prophet. What was his purpose? He was trying to stop the gospel from getting to him. Verse 9, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now let's look at the love that he pours out here. Verse 10, And said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? 
And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Well, what about uh, the love? Who was Paul? Was there love in the passage? Yes, there was. But who was the love for? It was for the deputy that wanted to know the gospel. And you had this false prophet, this child of Satan that jumped in between them and said, I'm going to stop this guy from getting saved. And you know, there's a lot of people that are like that today. And how should you handle those people as a Christian? Rebuke them sharply. Don't be nice to them. All right. Uh, another one here. Third John 1. There is only one chapter I realize, but it is a chapter, so we'll just say chapter 1. Third John 1, verse... Did I get that right? Third John 1, yeah, verse 9 through 11. Third John 1, 9 through 11. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrophes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So here this Diotrophes guy is actually a leader in the church, and he's saying, he, again, he's jumping in between the people that want to hear the truth, and between John, who wants to come and preach the truth. Again, rebuke them sharply. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, in conclusion here, Second Peter chapter two, or Second Peter chapter three. I can't read my notes this morning. What can we expect in the future from the skeptics? Second Peter chapter three, verse one. Just two more places to turn to here. Second Peter chapter three verse one. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both by in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments uh, or in the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You're going to run into scoffers. And you know the thing that's amazing to me? You read Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus is prophesying of the last days. Wars, rumors of wars. Is it fulfilled today? Absolutely. And it's not only fulfilled, but it's being fulfilled. All the time. It's not like, well, that happened and now we can't really prove it. It's getting worse and worse. All those things that Jesus Christ prophesied, they're coming to pass, and every day it's just getting truer and truer and truer. Famines. Yeah. There's famines. Pestilence. In other words, like diseases. Yeah. Okay. Earthquakes in diverse places. It's all there. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. There are men rising up all over this world right now saying that they're Jesus Christ. Kevin Donovan's neighbor. Yeah. This guy over in Australia, new guy, come out said he's Jesus. You know, telling women to leave their husbands and come live with him. Because he's Jesus Christ. You see? Vissarion, the Russian Antichrist, I did a message on him. You know, he actually looks like the pictures of the Jesus guy. You know, this dude in Australia, he doesn't look anything like the pictures. Whatever. But there's going to come scoffers. Even when the Bible is being fulfilled in the daily news, every single day, the Bible, the, the pages of Scripture are just, it's, it's just like you can, you know, go here for your news today. You know, even then, you still have scoffers. Just the way it's going to be. Look at verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store 
reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, notice it says there that they are willingly ignorant. It doesn't say that they really didn't know any better and, you know, God's so mean for judging them because they didn't know. It doesn't say that. They are willingly ignorant. Now we're going to turn to the last place here, Jude 1. Jude, right before the book of Revelation. We're going to hit just a couple of verses here and then we're going to close. Jude chapter 1, verse 17. It says here, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible has a lot to say about the words and the importance of the words. Verse 18, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, not ha or having not the Spirit. Okay, what are they separating themselves from? The Bible. They don't want anything to do with it. They don't want this book in their home. You know, it used to be the lost world would put a Bible in their house someplace. They didn't read it, but they'd have a Bible in their house. Now people are offended at this book. No, I don't want that Bible around me. So stay, you know, just keep it away from me. What are they doing? They're separating themselves. Why? Because they're sensual. They want to do things that fulfill the desires and the lusts of the flesh. And they know that this book is against that, so they just keep it away from me. It used to be that the lost world, they'd, they wouldn't mind hearing a sermon now and then. They'd have respect for a preacher. Not anymore. Not today. I don't want anything to do with it. Don't even talk to me about it. What are they doing? And what do they do? It's not just enough for them to say, hey, I don't want to hear about it. They'll mock you. Why? Well, because we're in the last days. Look at verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Okay? Don't quit studying because people are mocking you. Okay? And because they don't want to hear the truth. Now's the now, right now is the time. I heard this one time. There are some things that you can do in this life that you can't do in heaven. And one of those things is, to get to know God on a faith-based system. Jesus Christ talked about, you know, to His disciples, He was saying, you know, blessed are you that, you know, because you've seen Me, but blessed are they, you know, that have not seen Me and yet believe. Okay, living by faith is a more blessed thing. And it's kind of interesting, uh, just a thought kind of came to me on this whole thing. A woman will work harder when she's engaged to a man to impress her future husband, she'll work harder then than after she's married. You know, and it goes the same for a man too, you know. They, when you're dating, you work really hard to impress each other. You know, after you're married, it's kind of like, well, that, you know, <laughs> this is the way I am, you know. But guess what? We are the bride of Christ. We should work harder right now to get to know our future Lord and Savior and King, you know, and the bridegroom. We should be working very hard right now for him. So get busy if you're you know, part of the bride of Christ. Verse 22. Jump down there next. And if some have compassion, making a difference. You should have compassion for the lost world. And you should try to make a difference in their life. Good example of, of uh, the young man that we had here yesterday. You know? Some you have compassion. There are some people out there that don't know the truth and they want to know the truth. Okay, and you come to them in meekness, you come to them in love, have grace, remembering how you used to be, you know, that's great. And people, there are still people that are receptive to the gospel. Of some have compassion, making a difference. Verse 23, and others save with fear. Save them with fear. Hey, you know what's going to happen to you? You're in sin right now. And I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm not, I don't want to become your enemy because I tell you the truth. But i got to tell you the truth. I'm not going to be like these modern church preachers that tell you that God loves you when He doesn't. Save them with fear. Okay? You're on your way to hell right now. And you don't have to go there. Here's how you can get saved. And you can get out of that thing. Alright? Uh, it says here, pulling them out of the fire. There are some people that are so wicked right now 
you know, they're as good as being in hell. And you can witness to them and pull them out of that fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. We don't have too much time to go, okay, as Christians. Try very hard to keep yourself from falling into sin in the time that we have left. Okay, I don't believe that anybody here is going to have to go through another 30 or 40 years of life here on this planet and try to keep yourself through this whole time. Amen. I don't believe that. I think the time is very, very short. And I just want to end this thing here with kind of something that came to me. Just a little thing about the judgment seat of Christ. We were talking about it the other night and uh, brought back memories doing this testimony thing um, about my life in the past. And I was went to a public school. And I remember occasionally they would have a fund-raising thing. They'd give us a box of candy bars and we were supposed to go and sell these candy bars. And, you know, I was kind of shy growing up. I wasn't really outgoing. So, you know, I'd kind of try to sell them to my brothers and sisters and, you know, sell a couple to my parents. And I'd buy a couple with my allowance, you know. <laughs> And get sick from eating candy bars. But, you know, your grandparents would come over. You'd try to sell some of them. But uh, that's about it. I just kind of try to take care of my own family and my own life and stuff like that. And, you know, no big deal. I didn't care. You know, whatever. Just a stupid contest. And then you get there to school on that day and you're supposed to bring what remaining candy bars you have. You're supposed to bring them in and the money that you raised and the little paper you fill out. And you go in there and you turn in your candy bars and you say, here's the money, here's the paper. And they give you a little coupon or something for the, the prize that you win. And, you know, you're like, well, no big deal. You know, hey, this is kind of cool. I got a prize, you know, whatever. And you all sit down and the principal comes in and he says, okay, you know, we're going to announce who did the best and everything. And he stands up and he tells some little kid to stand up. And all of a sudden, that little table, prize table, you're looking over at that, and then all of a sudden they bring, I remember this the one time, this actually happened. They brought this really neat bicycle in. And all the kids just, wow, you know, a bicycle. And it's, you know, little Joey or something, I think his name was Joe actually. And they said, you know, Joe, could you please stand up? And they said, Joe here sold, I mean, it was like ridiculous. It was like 20 boxes of candy bars or something. I mean, just, you know, I mean, he must have been going up and down the streets, you know, going door to door just a fanatic for selling these candy bars. And, you know, at the time, when I got into the thing, I thought to myself, well, who cares? I sold a couple candy bars, no big deal. But when I saw the rewards, and I looked down and I realized I basically could choose from a couple pencils or a rubber snake or, or you know, an eraser <laughs> or something. All of a sudden, it was like, you know what? I should have tried harder. And it, it hit me, and I was like, oh, man. And you know what went through my head? I wish I could go back. I wish I could sell more candy bars. Because I see now the rewards. Something else. And, you know, that's going to hit a lot of people when they get to heaven. You know, it's breaking up here. It's, it's rough. You know, we don't think about eternal rewards. And I know, <clears throat> excuse me, and I know that, you know, I mean, people say, well, you're in ministry, Brian. You know, you're doing things. You're, you're going to be blessed. Yeah, but 30 years. 30 years of wasted life here on this earth. 30 years of being a poor Christian, of just being a waste, doing nothing for the Lord. Three years of ministry and service. And I've had failures in that time. I'll tell you what. It's something to think about. Right now is the only chance that you have to work for those rewards in heaven. So, just a little challenge there at the end of the sermon. Just, uh, you know, like I said, something that came back to me when I was, you know, doing this testimony thing. And just thinking about it, how it's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be rough. You better make sure that you have faith in your convictions, faith in the Bible that you preach 
out of that you tell people is God's Word. You better make sure that you're doing things according to the Scriptures. Not trying to please yourself and exalt yourself. Okay? Because there's going to be a lot of Christians that are going to get up to the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be rough. You know, man, it's a sobering thought to think about. So what do you do when you have critics that come? Well, come to them first in meekness. Have grace for them. Answer with a little bit of salt. Make sure you don't, you're not embarrassed by the Word of God. Hit them a little bit. It's a double-edged sword. But, you know, don't be a coward. I know that's tough. I have been, you know, many times in my life. Look for opportunities. Look for doors that the Lord has opened for you. And then walk through it. And trust that the Lord's going to bless that. So that's going to be it for this morning. Hope that was a challenge to you. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.